Welcome to The Staff Room, an education podcast which takes a look into the world of pedagogy. In this series, we meet educators far and wide to chat about teaching and learning and share outstanding practice. My name is Michael Royale, and I'm sitting here with Tessa Johnson, and we're coming to you from Corpus Christi College in Perth, Australia. In this episode, we'll be chatting about leading change in schools. We'll be speaking to special guest, Abdul Chohan. Abdul is an award-winning learning technology consultant and an inspirational change management expert who is known for his integration of digital learning strategies in a number of UK schools. Stay with us to hear what he's got to say about the way technology can change our schools for the better. I think that knowing your organisation and knowing the people, um, that's really important. I think with any change management process, especially when it comes to introducing technology whole school, we also hear from Vice Principal of Corpus Christi College, Karen Prendergast. Karen tells us about the way she and her colleagues are leading change by developing a research based school wide pedagogy with the University of Southern Queensland. Teachers will embrace change if they understand the reasons why, if they feel that it's going to be, um, it's going to have some longevity, and if they feel that it's in the best interest of the students. I'm Michael Royale. And I'm Tessa Johnson. And this is The Staff Room. Abdul Chohan is a school leader and keynote speaker based in the UK. He is widely known for his pioneering work at Easter Academy and the Olive Tree School. Abdul has also worked with a number of international schools and organisations on developing leadership strategies based on changing belief through simplicity and reliability. Abdul joins us via FaceTime today to share and reflect on leading change. Okay, so welcome, Abdul, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, Now, just for our listeners, could you please just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in education? Okay, so um, my name's Abdul. I'm from um, the UK, a small town just outside uh, Manchester called Bolton. Um, My background is really as a chemistry teacher. I taught chemistry for almost 11 years. Then I became part of a a senior leadership team of a high school, Um, after which um, I took on the principal's role. And then I was a CEO of an academy trust, which runs a few different schools. Um, And then for about the last three years, I founded my own school, Um, which I'm the chair of at the moment, Um, and I do a lot of kind of focused work around there in terms of starting new schools and developing new organisations and people. Um, And just as a background, my kind of, um, I suppose, my uh, focus and interest has been very much around the whole idea of using mobile technology in schools to to look at improvements, to look at efficiencies. Um, and that's a project I started around in 2008 in my in my previous school. And it's something that we've continued at the Olive Tree as well. Could you just a little uh, elaborate about that? Because I know you started um, back in 2008. You introduced, uh, was it iPhones first or was it iPods into the school? I- iPods, it was, yes, it was iPod touches. Yeah. And, and how did that uh, initially sort of go down with the students? Um, it went, it was kind of, um, I suppose looking back and uh, at that time it was kind, it was seen as a bit of a wacky move because, um, we had just gone through a big change. It was a school that was, you know, about to close down. It was a school that had a half a million pound of deficit. And here we are suddenly, you know, giving a device to every student. I think, um, the critics at the time said that, you know, we were bribing children to come to school. Um, and, you know, we, it was a, a kind of interesting transition. I suppose, logically, it started from the idea that, you know, we just wanted technology that's going to be simple, reliable, it's going to be stuff that just works. Um, and I think that's where we've kind of found our magic in terms of, you know, how that impacted the classroom. And I think teachers came on board very, very quickly because for the first time ever, they had a little computer that when they switched on, it actually came on. It didn't ask them for a username and password and didn't have to go and make coffee and come back um, and wait for the whole thing to to start up and be ready. Mm. 
Um, so in our last few episodes, we've spoken about tech integration, assessment and engagement, but we haven't really touched deeply on change management. Uh, so what do you think is necessary to lead successful change? Yeah, I think that's probably one of the most critical things for school leaders to under to understand. Um, I think that knowing your organisation and knowing the people, um, that's really important. I think with any change management process, especially when it comes to introducing technology whole school, um, I suppose in some ways it's I, I've likened it um, to being on an island and we're telling our people that. We're moving to a, a different island on the on the other side, where it's going to be a lot better, and things are going to be, you know, m much more fun, and it's going to have lots of advantages and so on. And no sooner do you present that idea and that vision to the organisation, you always have the first group of people, which I kind of call the swimmers, who are already in the water swimming towards the island, you know, and those are the guys that really kind of. Um, uh, are interested in kind of making things happen. They like change, they like the adoption and so on. You also get the second group that kind of stand on the edge of the island. And um, they kind of look at the swimmers and they ask questions like, what if there are sharks in the water? What will happen if there's going to be a problem? What will happen if? And so on. So they're not saying no, but they actually want to see some evidence, they want to see some practice, they want to hear their peers talking about this uh, in an effective way and in a positive way. And then you also get the third group of people that are kind of holding on to the trees, our tree huggers, you know, and they don't want to move and they're kind of stuck on the island and they're just saying they're quite happy where they are and so on. And, and that in itself is kind of an important thing as well, because sometimes these are the people that typically have been through change and it hasn't worked and they've been introduced to tools and technology in the past and it's not been effective and so on. So for me, it's about how you kind of build um, a critical mass with this group. And what we've done typically and what I've done with um, schools and organizations that I've worked with internationally as well is we've used swimmers to convince the shark spotters and we've created a critical mass in an organization and that's it's different strategies that you may use based on the context of the organization and so on but it's really important to understand that this isn't an overnight change it's something that will take time and it's important to kind of communicate it's important to incentivize it's really important you know to to communicate at all levels. Um, and I think the most effective kind of change management I see is when, you know, leaders appreciate the three groups and kind of put in the right kind of support mechanisms for, for all of these three groups to help them move over. I don't think you always get 100%, you know, commitment from everyone, but quite often getting a critical mass, 80%, 75% people saying yes, you know, and then it's kind of time to, to move island. It's time to time to move. That's great. Um, so in your work with ESSER Academy and the Olive Tree, you pride yourself in not only the relationships that you build with students, but also the relationships within the wider community. How important are relationships in change management? I, I think relationships are key. I think, um, you know, that's probably one of the most um, powerful ingredients in terms of, you know, getting people and uh, convincing people and bringing them over. I think good relationships at the foundation of, of, of a good school. And I think relationships, good relationships are based on increased transparency. So the way in which we've kind of established uh, relationships is we've made things very, very transparent. And our key, two key pillars of any school uh, uh, is, is teaching and learning. So teaching in terms of learning design and how teachers plan tasks and what activities the children are doing and so on. Um, and at the same time, the assessment, the feedback, the marking that happens that goes to and fro and so on. And what we've done um, is we've made those two things very, very transparent with the wider community, with parents. Um, but t it's technology that's allowed us to make that happen. Um, and when um, the wider community see this and when wider communities see that it's actually not just about using a few fancy apps, um, but it's, there's a lot more rigor in this, there's depth in this and so on. 
that's when we begin to kind of see um, a change in belief and a change in behaviour from um, the different stakeholders. So this is, um, I guess, when you're marking and when you're um, giving feedback to students, you're saying parents are privy to that as well, so they can see that through technology as well as their child? That. That's right. So, for example, at the olive tree, and, and I think this is where we've taken it a lot further, the olive tree, compared to when I was at ISA. Um, it's where now we've actually eradicated marking in books. So the, that whole notion of teachers taking 30 books home and, you know, doing the whole ceremony around marking books and so on, that's totally gone. We don't do that anymore. What now happens is that children will do their work. It might be in books with pen to paper because parents will still see that and... You know, our final exams in the UK are still pen to paper, so that still has to happen. But, you know, in the same way, children might make a movie, they might make an animation, they might do something physical, making a whole project with cardboard boxes and so on. Whatever they do, they then take a picture of that, um, a photo of that, and then that's what they submit. And then what our teachers are doing now is they're using voice feedback. So they're actually giving feedback to, to children uh, using voice, and we've developed policies on this, uh, how we give feedback, what's good quality feedback. And interestingly, as a school leader, that's been really quite fascinating in terms of improving outcomes for children, because when we first started to do this, we then realised that actually not everybody understands what good feedback is, you know, because it's suddenly transparent and we could see it. So therefore, you know, we could... Um, fix things that needed fixing and we could amend our professional development timetable through the year and so on. But what's fascinating is now when we speak to our parents, our parents can actually hear the teacher's feedback, verbal feedback, and, you know, the conversations that they're having with their children on a daily basis are very different. It's no longer about what are you doing at school, but they're actually saying, well, you know, I, I, this was really good. I heard your teacher say you've done this really well. But let's look at how we can, and so on. So parents are actually getting involved in those conversations with their children. Just out of curiosity as well, uh, what are the programs that you are using for this feedback? Because I, I know we've had some, um, it, we've had some experience with OneNote and Shobi. Is there another particular app that is yeah. good for this? Yeah, I mean, OneNote is really good. Shobi is really good. We're actually using Shobi. Um, and the reason why we're using Shobi is simply because... Um, we, there's there's two things that we that we look at from uh, from perspective of you know which app should be used. We look for simplicity and we're looking for reliability. So it's got to be really really easy to use, um, and it's got to be really intuitive, and that's one of the things that we look for. The other thing why we use Shobi is because um, for us um, you know the idea of multiple m marking up documents with multiple voice feedback that's been quite important for us. So, and I think it was, I think we were using this before the one no, whole one note thing came out as well. So therefore we've kind of stuck to that. I mean, we will look at other tools as well, but, um, you know, if something would have to come along, that's a lot better than what we're using now for us to then uh, look at uh, changing what we're doing at the moment. But I think the other thing is, is that we've turned this into policy and at the olive tree, I've recently also, well, I say recently over the last 18 months or so, we've introduced the concept of non-negotiables. So what this means is that whoever comes to that organization, whichever teachers begin to work there, they understand what our non-negotiables are and how we, and, and a non-negotiable is one of those kind of tools, one of those approaches to learning that makes the school what it is. So it's not your teacher contract, but it's how we work. It's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, a new, if a new teacher came into the organization, um, they would have to know that these are non-negotiables and these are things you have to do if you work here. And that's when they make their choice whether they want to work there or not. That means we continue to have that critical mass of people that have belief in what it is that we're doing and how we're doing it as well. Yeah, I like, this. I like the sound of that. Um, now, talking about printing now, because uh, we spoke to our learner of mm. technologies, Daniel Budd, in episode one, and he was talking about having this culture of printing um, in schools. We know you have your own vision on printing in textbooks. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how this has benefited your school? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, it's... it's uh, pretty fantastic to kind of see um, 
the typical numbers um, and, and costs associated with printing. Um, so, you know, in a school where students don't have devices and, you know, it's just kind of raw, what you might call a traditional kind of setup, um, typically, you know, and as is typically we're kind of looking at um, leasing costs, we're looking at obviously the the paper costs, we're also looking at, you know, the ink and all that sort of stuff. But I think what's really kind of expensive is the fact that we're, we, we sometimes don't account for the time of teachers, yeah. So how long it takes to print and all the processes that are associated with that and, and so on. And I think that sometimes is something that, that isn't always measured very, very well. Um, whereas finances are obviously tangible things and you can measure it very, very quickly. So in, in my experience, where we've moved to a one-to-one -one environment where you have non-negotiables, the fact that you can have a document and you push the send button and it automatically goes to so many students, that is the equivalent of standing in a photocopy and printing off 30 sheets of paper. And then the time it takes to kind of go around and give them all out to students. So we've, at ESA, when I was there, there's new management now. I, I'm, I'm not so sure what process they're using and, and how they're moving on with things, but... Um, what I do know is that, you know, their kind of um, um, the, the, the impact on teacher time and, and workload is, is huge. Um, what we've also seen um, when I was at ESA was we saw a 70% reduction in printing. So back from the days when we were kind of traditional, we had copiers and all over the place and all the leases and so on. When we moved to a one-to-one -one environment, um, that's when we kind of realized that we saw a massive reduction in printing. And that wasn't something back in 2008 that we, we set out to do. We just thought, you know, access to internet, access to calendar, and these sorts of things were, would be really powerful. Um, but we actually saw teachers certainly then taking screenshots, taking photos of documents, and then just uploading them. Um, we also then began to look at textbooks as well and the idea of what a textbook is. Um, and what we discovered is that for the price and the amount that we were spending on textbooks, it was far easier for us to kind of, um, you know, employ two students straight out of university that understood Photoshop and things like that very well. And, you know, teachers could send through their, their detailed resources and they could suddenly use iBooks Author to make some fantastic interactive textbooks, um, which is a project that we then started at ISA. Um, and that was um, very, very successful in terms of teachers using these tools and we were able to share that outwards with, with other organizations as well. Um, so, and I think, you know, as I hear more about more and more schools that are in this one-to-one -one environment, the reduction in printing is something that you are beginning to see um, across the board. Um, but again, it comes back down to change management. It's, it's back down to what are we not doing? You know, um, and where those discussions are had, we're seeing a significant reduction in the cost, but also in teacher time, the amount of time teachers spend in kind of, you know, um, printing and photocopying and so on. And that is, there's a significant uh, reduction in all of those things. Because mm. I guess that, that time isn't something we often think about. We think of, you know, the environmental factors and the cost, but you're yeah. right, it does, it is very time consuming, standing by the photocopier, waiting in line, Half the time it's broken, that's right. so it's yeah, it's exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I think that that's a, it, it's a, it's a big thing at the moment in the UK. We have a big, we've have been having big discussions, and it's hit the political agenda in terms of teacher workload and reducing teacher workload because um, teacher retention has become a problem. You know, finding teachers is becoming harder. Certain subjects, you know, it's almost like it's almost impossible to find teachers like physics and mathematics and so on. People are really struggling. And one of the reasons is that the teacher workload is actually pretty significant in the amount of time that you have to do things. And, you know, we see lots of industries around us that are using technology to harness efficiencies um, in the work that they do. Um, unfortunately, uh, mainstream education hasn't moved in that direction. We recognize the importance of technology and coding and all these sorts of things, but actually harnessing efficiencies through technology, that is change management. That means looking at our processes and saying, you know, we need to do this differently. And also asking that question, what do we not need to do anymore? Mm -hmm. 
Um, on that note, um, I'm sure you can attest to this, but change is obviously quite challenging, especially under those time constraints like printing, for instance, that you're mentioning and yeah. other ones as well. Um, so we've seen a bit of a J curve or of change uptake in our own school. What strategies can school leaders put in place to assist teachers with change? Yeah, I mean, you know, over the years, I've seen lots of different things. Myself, I've employed lots of different ways in doing things. Um, some of the strategies we've used where we've kind of, um, you know, worked very closely with certain teachers, potentially the swimmers, if you want, but there's always have to be. Um, and we've kind of, you know, worked with a team of, of good teachers to kind of understand you know, what good good practices, how can we kind of harness those efficiencies and so on. And we get, you know, eight or nine people that we've worked with very, very closely. And then um, those people become your kind of digital champions, if you want. Um, they then kind of work, have a group of another eight or nine people that, that they then kind of work with to put processes and systems in place. Um, so that way you kind of have this hub and spoke model where you kind of spe uh, share good practice very, very quickly. The other thing that we've done as well is we've also engaged students. So we've had um, student leaders in our school. There's about 20 of them that have done a variety of different courses and, and things like that, the way they kind of understand and can, can be supportive to teachers as well. So we understand that in terms of creating capacity and getting to physically just understand devices and how to use tools, students can actually support that process very, very well. And, you know, they're quite eager to do that. So we've actually put an official program in place to make that happen. So lunch times, break times after school, they're on clinics, teachers can book in um, and, you know, they can get support if teachers find a new app. They don't really have the time to figure it all out. They can... Um, ask the students, you know, to have a have a look at this app and explain how it works and is it going to be useful and this is what I'm trying to do with it. Um, and students will come back with a detailed kind of answer in terms of yes, you can or no, you can't and so on. Um, the, the other things that we've done as well is we've really looked at professional development. Um, so one of the things we introduced at ESA and I've kind of brought it to the olive tree as well is um, we... Our, week, our school week is, has professional development incorporated within it. So Friday afternoon, children tend to go home a little early um, and it's compulsory professional development for teachers. And within that time, um, we have teachers that kind of share best practice. So we have something called one best things. So teachers stand up, they have 60 seconds to kind of just share some good practice. It doesn't always kind of have to involve technology, but quite often there will be an element of that in terms of things that's just making life easier, things that are working really well. But we also have um, something called one best failure. So what did I try this week that didn't work? You know, um, and I think it's important to share failures as well. So other people, it saves them time from having to go through the same process. So it gives them the opportunity to build on that failure and look for a, a different route or a different solution. Um, so that all of those kind of things have really kind of um, assisted teachers with change, you know, because there's a whole culture of change. There's a culture of, hey, if it doesn't work, it's okay. You know, I've seen other teachers talk about the fact that they've tried something and it hasn't worked and so on. Um, yeah, and I think, um, you know, we've really kind of, we've really kind of, um, embedded the idea of simplicity and reliability. So we're getting our teachers to look for tools and approaches that are very simple and reliable, you know, um, and that's really quite key because um, complica being com making things complicated or key leaving things complicated is an easier thing to do sometimes. But to simplify something and look for simple approaches, it sometimes takes um, a lot more hard work, but it's worth... Um, it's worth the effort because people come on board because it's easy to understand and it's easy to do. How do you then measure that change or the impact of that change? So we've, we've been using a, different, a number of different strategies at the moment. So at the lowest level, it's just kind of, you know, um, we, can, we can ask students about certain things and you get feedback. And for some things, students will come back and you get an overwhelming positive response and so on. We can measure things with our parents. What do you think about this? How is How important is this to you? And so on. So recently you'll have heard in the UK, we've had the whole GDPR thing and data thing. So we've had to send letters home 
asking parents about, you know, um, access to iTunes Zoo, access to Shobi and so on. And, you know, all the parents are kind of, they want access to that. They want to be able to see that and so on. So that's been quite an interesting one. But also what we've, what we've done as well is um, we've started to do small case studies um, with teachers. So, for example, with voice feedback and the way in which assessment and planning and things like that happens, we've done a few small kind of case studies with teachers that look at things in a little bit more kind of in-depth way. We're using different tools to kind of video research so we can kind of um, turn video into data. So there's tools like VO, for example, VEO, that allow me to kind of um, record a 15 second clip or a one minute clip and then I can tag all the different actions that I'm seeing in the video in terms of you know is there effective use of technology or is effective use of the iPad for example or and so on and, and then that will turn that into statistical data for me it will give me numbers of yes I've seen good use or you no, know, I've seen this many instances of you know distraction and so on um, so things like that have been quite powerful. The other thing that we've introduced as well now in terms of measurement, because one of the things for me is that this potentially could all be said to be biased because it's being done by um, the school itself, right? So we've, what we've done is we've enlisted, um, we've connected with a local university. So the University of Hull is now working with us and they've been very happy to kind of send in some research students, PhD students that are doing independent case studies. So verbal feedback reduction on workload and so on. Um, that's something that they're doing um, at the school. So that's that's also a quite a powerful avenue um, where they come in, they, they take they do case studies with different teachers, they'll speak to parents, they take a wider sample if you want over a longer period of time. Um, and that's kind of you know giving us some very hard data in terms of you know, where we see um, effectiveness and where we can actually say, yes, this is actually making a difference and we can get a variety of different impact measurements as well. Oh, well, thank you so much, um, um, Abdul. Um, we've Obviously, you're a very good leader in your own right and some fantastic tips there for not just other leaders but also for staff just being able to communicate with their students um, and their parents much more seamlessly. Um, before we say goodbye, could you please tell our listeners where they can find you online and also where they could hear you speak in the near future? Oh, right. Okay, so... Um where are we? Um, online, I'm probably most active um, on Twitter. So you can follow me on Twitter at Abdul Choham. Um, I tend to kind of post on there where I am and where which places I'm going to and, and things like that. Um, also, um, I suppose the next, my next trip is probably going to be in Sweden, which is, I know, still the other side of the world for you. Um, and then in November, I'm speaking at a few conferences in in um, uh, speaking at a few conferences in, in Dubai. But um, yeah, I mean, I do come to Australia quite often. I've been in a project there in Melbourne at the moment at a college called, college called Al-Sirat College. Um, and they've just, all the stuff that I've been talking about there, we've kind of been implementing um, in that place. So we've got a six month, seven month program. I'll probably be back there in, in June, around the end of June or something. I think the dates are still to be firmed up. Um, but yeah, um, looking forward to it. That's great. Uh, thanks so much, Abdul. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Thank you very much. And enjoy the rest of your day. You've still got a lot of your Wonderful. day to go. <laughs> yeah. <See you> later. <laughs> Just starting. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. <laughs> See ya. See you later. Karen Prendergast is the Vice Principal of Corpus Christi College in Perth, Western Australia. Karen joins us in the studio today to chat about leading a vision for a school-wide teaching philosophy. So hi, Karen, and thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us today. Just to start us off, we're wondering if you could please give our listeners a little bit of information about yourself. Okay, Tess, it's nice to be with you both. Um, currently, I'm, I have the role of Vice Principal at Corpus Christi College in um, Bateman, Perth. I've been at the college for three years or so. Um, before that, I, I was at Newman College as Deputy Principal Teaching and Learning. Um, before that, the majority of my career um, I was spent in the UK where I taught uh, for about 20 years. 
As we know, Corpus Christi College has been working with the University of Southern Queensland to develop a school-wide pedagogy. Can you explain what this means? <laughs> yeah, it sounds very fancy, doesn't it? So I suppose I need to take a couple of steps back from what it means and give you a little bit of context about why we're doing it in the first place. So as a college, we, we knew that we wanted to further develop our teaching and learning or our pedagogy. Um, there's lots and lots of research out there, lots of information out there, lots of initiatives out there about how to do that. But we really wanted to dive a little deeper and look at um, what we mean by pedagogy, what good practices with regards to teaching and learning, and to really put it on some sort of research uh, foundation. So we work, and we're currently working with the University of Southern Queensland. Um, we're involved in a two-year project which is called the Ideas Project. And the whole purpose of ideas is to work with the broad college community, so parents, staff, teach, uh, sorry, parents, staff, and students, to um, survey their their perception about teaching and learning at the college. That's the starting point, and really take that feedback to guide the direction of the project over the two years to see what we need to focus on to um, to develop our a vision first of all, and then a, a pedagogy around that. So we're in the second year of that. Progress, pro, uh, process at the moment. So how do you go to make sure that all those parties, so the students, the teachers and the parents, all have a say in this pedagogy? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we did, first of all, um, we surveyed those groups and we got a really, really good response rate from those groups. So we had a good database um, on which to start the project or on which to base our, our development, if you like, over the two years. Um, Often parents are surveyed by schools, but perhaps not so often about teaching and learning. It can be about other aspects of college life. So we, um, we, we really needed that information and we really needed to know what students thought and what teachers' perception was of the, the current state of play, if you like, to baseline it. We took that data and then developed a report card. And basically what the data was telling us was that there was a lack of... Um, alignment or commonality around um, pedagogy, what people thought was good pedagogical practice and whether or not we had a clear pedagogical vision. So we knew that that's what we needed to focus on. And the project itself it always starts from the point of developing a vision for learning and then everything that comes after that is aligned to the vision but very much within the context of the college. So each college, each school will be different in terms of what it focuses on. How will this change in culture make a difference at the college? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question, Michael, because culture is the significant thing here. So I'd say there was lots of good practice going on in the college and there continues to be lots of good practice. What we want to do is harness that good practice and share it. So the culture, I suppose, relies on collaboration. Um, the, the project itself, ideas, is absolutely based on managing change um, effectively and there's a lot of consultation there's a lot of uh, feedback from staff there's an ideas team that's um, made up of 16 members of staff and people ha um, expressed an interest to take part in that so it was it's people from all different areas of the college different levels of experience different responsibility levels and the team has the responsibility for driving the project. So the culture is really around um, consultation, collaboration, sharing practice, being open to feedback is really important, um, peer observation, peer feedback, um, people setting goals, really trying to get an, an alignment so that it's not about taking on the most recent initiative it's about knowing what corpus is about what do we believe in what does it mean to come and work at corpus what does it mean if you're a student at corpus so obviously you're still in the process mm. of um, implementing this um, this new change to the college mm. but what are the challenges that you have faced in actually leading this process so far Look, there have been lots of challenges and lots of opportunities. Um, from my point of view, I'm the, I, I lead the ideas team in the sense that um, I suppose I facilitate the work of the team and coordinate the, the different activities that need to occur and the timeline of events and so on. For me, I suppose the challenges are around um, ensuring all members of the team have 
an input. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something which has really developed over time. The team is, works quite differently now to the way it did perhaps a year ago as we've, as we've become more familiar with working with each other. We've learned good, um, I suppose, rules of engagement and we've learned to be good listeners and we've, we've learned how to have deliberate conversations. So um, that's been a, a real bonus, I think, of the process that um, you can see members of the team growing in confidence and uh, particularly perhaps the less experienced members of the team bringing to it a, a completely different flavour and having the confidence to to speak out and say, oh, have we thought about this and maybe we could do it that way. And, you know, so there's, there's a lot of um, positives around the team working well together. Challenges, I suppose challenges particularly in the earlier days was when we planned an event with staff and we went and, and, and you know facilitated it and we perhaps didn't get the response that we thought we might and some it could be a bit disheartening but we remembered that we just had to stick stay true to the process just stay true to it stick with it it's part of the process people need to be heard people's stories need to be valued and they need to understand why we're doing what we're doing um, so it's, it's not something that's done to them, they're part of it. So it's also, there's been challenges around that um, notion of, well, I gave this feedback, but it wasn't taken on board. And, you know, really the, the learning around that is giving feedback is different from sharing an opinion that's then followed. It, it, you can have your feedback, but it might not actually come to fruition. That's, you still have a voice. But I think that as the as the project's developed, I think the staff see that. Um, and and I mean, another great success, I think, of the project has been the staff buy-in. Um, and, and so one of the things I've learned is to keep an open mind. Don't preempt what you think might happen because often you're wrong. Yeah. So we, we know that teachers and or any staff members are generally pretty resistant to change, but obviously changing the teaching and learning culture is a very substantial change. So what um, advice would you give to leaders that they should know before they go about you know, going in and changing the teaching and learning culture of a school? I don't necessarily think that teachers are resistant to change. I think teachers can be incredibly flexible. I think what they are resistant to is change for change's sake because most teachers have seen a lot of change throughout their careers and sometimes haven't seen the benefits of them. Um, they, they invest a lot of time and energy into planning their lessons. They, they think long and hard about activities that they're they're um, offering to students so you know those things need to be valued so I think that um, teachers will embrace change if they understand the reasons why if they feel that it's going to be um, it's going to have some longevity and if they feel that it's in the best interest of the students and if it's not just something else that's being put on top of existing practices so it's got to be a fundamental um, there's got to be a rationale for it and there has to be that alignment between the different different things that the school does. Uh, so in change management, how important is it that staff set goals which align with the school's strategic plan? Okay, so if we think about how we, we want to um, conduct ourselves as a Catholic workplace, we have very much at the centre of what we do um, the coaching culture. That's what we're continually trying to develop. So... That, that's a, a big thing, you know, so it, it should permeate all aspects of school life. But one aspect of it is the, the you know, the, the individual teacher being reflective about their own practice, identifying um, a couple of areas that they would like to focus on um, for development of their practice, and then doing some goal setting, having some goal setting conversations with the head of learning area or their line manager. So I think <laughs> the goal setting is probably the starting point. Um, it's more how the conversations support the move to action and how conversations enable people to sometimes have those more sensitive talks about things that maybe aren't going as, as well as they could be and how a person can be supported to, to, um, to address that. So what I've noticed is that it's the individual, you want that to come from the individual. You, want, you know when it's working well when somebody comes to speak to you and says, Karen, I've been trying to, you know, I'm working on this and I'm getting frustrated because I don't think I'm doing it very well. Or, and you sort of go, well, hang on a minute, let's have a look at this. And they're actually driving the process themselves um, because 
goal setting can be something again that is um, required of people but it's much more effective if people are actually wanting to do it and are you know picking really quite challenging goals for themselves obviously link into school strategic plans and what have you but strategic plans are pretty broad and, and most goals professional goals in a school would link to some aspect of the plan so i I'm, I'm a firm advocate of um a coaching approach I'm, I'm an accredited coach myself and um i think that those you know uh, tr respectful challenging professional conversations are really crucial to further creating this culture of performance and development and, and that all supports a change management process i mean people need to be able to voice their concerns about a change need to be able to ask questions and feel um confident to do that so i think it's important uh, how is goal setting supported by growth coaching? Okay, so the well, the, if you look at the coaching model, um, I mean, coaching is a, is a relatively new area in in um, this professional environment. But the goal is important. But as I said, it's the starting point of the process, and the conversations around the goal are just as important as the goal itself. So somebody might identify a goal they have, and it might be that they I don't know they want to. Um, use IT to more effectively support the teaching and learning that's a very broad goal what does that mean how are you going to know if you've achieved it so the coach can help the person who has that sort of goal to refine it to think about what it looks like to break it down into actions that might be you know, two or three weeks long and then they they touch base again again not for a huge long conversation for 10 or 15 minutes how are you going how did that how did you go towards that action did it work out did, is, you know do you need to refine it and just having somebody that touches base with you to see how you how you progress and I think is a really positive experience um, but of course people need to be able to identify their own goals and the things that are important to them and then our whole professional learning program supports that in the sense that as you know, teachers choose the, the professional learning that they want to attend. It's in house. Um, we've got we've got this our Celtic program. We've got a Celtic session tonight. But you pick the ones that you want to go to that help you to address the areas that you feel you'd like to focus on. So it's supporting people to um, be responsible for their own learning and um, and then obviously contribute to the learning of others because the teachers also deliver the Celtic sessions. So are these goals setting, is these goals made accountable then? Are they, we know that good goals should be time bound. Mm. Are they given a set amount of time to achieve their goals or is it just sort of, you know, it depends on what the goal is? Mm. It's really important, I think, that it's not a paper activity. So yes, there should be some records of it, but the records should be between the coach and the coachee. Um, the accountability really needs to come from the person themselves, but the coach can help them with that. I mean, I always think it's a little bit like being on a diet. You know, if you tell somebody that you're going to do it, then you've, you, you've, you're, all, you're already more accountable because you've shared that with somebody. So if you, if, if you have a good relationship with your coach, which is really key to it, it's got to be a, a relationship where trust is very high, um, I think there is a personal accountability anyway. The coach can you know develop the relationship around that and will through catch up check in conversations be able to um, ask the person who's being coached how they're going whether they need any support and just to get a gauge of where they're up to really Okay, Karen, thank you so much for talking for us uh, with us today. Um, very, very insightful. A lot of very good tips for leadership as well. So thank you very much and um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Karen. You're welcome. Mike. Thank you. So, uh, Tess, we just spoke to Abdul and Karen. What were some of the takeaways you got from Abdul? Oh, I, I really liked the island analogy that he used, um, sort of saying, you know, when you introduce something new, you're going to have your tree huggers, the ones that are going to sort of cling to the ways of old, and then the others that are going to just jump right in and, and get it done. And, yeah, I thought that was quite a quite an accurate way of looking at things. And also I think he said, you know, in, in sort of building relationships, you need to have a critical mass, I think was the word he used. Um, we have got sort of a lot of people um, on board, and I think that's quite true as well. How about you, Mike? What do you think? Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's interesting what you said about relationships because Karen also spoke a bit about that, but in a different sort of a context. So she was saying that staff need to feel that change is done with them and not to them as such. 
And I thought that was really quite profound. That's right, because I guess you've got to have, I mean, at staff members, I think she said, have to really believe that what they're doing is going to be worthwhile in order to actually get on board with that change. Yeah, exactly. Thanks so much for listening to The Staff Room. And thanks to our guests, Abdul Chohan and Karen Prendergast. If you would like to follow us on Twitter, my handle is at Michael underscore Royale and Tessa's is at Tessa underscore Johnson too. Please make sure you subscribe to our podcast on either iTunes or Stitcher. And feel free to leave a review and give us any feedback on the show. Listen out for our next episode of The Staff Room, which will be available shortly. I'm Michael Royale. And I'm Tessa Johnson. Until next time.